Welcome to Shipwreck Sunday, where we investigate disasters at sea and the impact that they have on the world today. My name is Eleanor, and here with me is my co-host, Eric. Hello. Today we will be exploring the sinking of the whale ship X Essex, which inspired Herman Melville's Moby Dick. Before we dive in, we must inform you. This story does include details of a maritime disaster resulting in the sinking of a vessel, cannibalism, emotional and physical distress, wailing, and death that may be disturbing to some audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Please note before we begin that neither Eleanor nor I are mariners or experts in the field of maritime history, but we've done our research and will present the information as we understand it and with accurate nautical terminology. In today's episode, we will be garnering information from primary sources and we will be transparent when these details are not verified. Before we get started, we will go over the basics of nautical terminology. The bow is the very front part of the ship and the very back end of it is called the stern. The port side is the left and the starboard side is the right. Propellers are sometimes referred to as screws. The hull is the metal sides of the ship, the keel is the very bottom of it, and the superstructure is the top deck, usually made of wood. Smokestacks, or funnels, are large tunnels on top of the ship used to direct steam and smoke away from the deck. Masts are large wooden poles on the deck of the ship, usually used to hoist sails or hold a crow's nest, where crew members can see for miles around the vessel. Beam is a measurement that refers to the width of the ship. Thank you, Derek. Today's vessel is the oldest we've talked about so far, and our story begins in 1799 in Amesbury, Massachusetts. There is a limited amount of information about the construction and early career of Essex, so we will provide the information we do have and look into the history of whaling, and then we will round back to the Essex. The industry of whaling, or hunting whales primarily for blubber and oil, began in 11th century Basque culture. The Basques hunted northern right whales and traded the products from them to support their culture and it unfortunately led to northern right whales becoming one of the most endangered species of the great whales. Soon after, the Dutch and British began their own whaling ventures with the Americans, Norwegians, and many other nations following the suit later on. Humpback and sperm whales became the biggest targets and leader whaling vendors, being their, their fat and blubber could become oil or lighting oil lamps. In the late 19th century, the whaling industry evolved into an entirely different beast with the development of steamships. The faster blue whales that would once evade hunters were now being hunted down by steamers and their crew, once again, for blubber and oil. The explosive harpoon was another deadly blow to the whale populace, as this added to the accuracy and carnage that people were able to inflict on whale populations. The spread of whaling led to a heavy decrease in whale populations, pushing whales to the poles and therefore pushing their hunters to the poles to hunt the large feeding whales like the baleen whale, whose glycerin was used in explosives for the First World War provided by the British and Norwegians. At the same time, Japanese whalers were developing coastal whaling techniques that were mainly used on humpback, right, and gray whales. Although whales are migratory animals and they aren't always in the same place, they were disappearing everywhere, and it was becoming obvious that whales needed protection. By 1925, the League of Nations recognized whales were being exploited and the need for whaling regulations, and in 1930, they finally did something about it. The Bureau of International Whaling Statistics was set up in 1930 in order to keep track of the whale population versus the number of catches in any given year and it gave away for the first international regulatory agreement, the Convention of Regulation of Whaling, that was eventually signed by 22 different nations in 1931. Unfortunately, two of the biggest problems in whaling, the Japanese and the Germans, did not join the convention, and this led to the deaths of 43,000 whales that year. More and more species of great whales were being hunted to near extinction during this time, and for the rest of the 1930s, the nations in the convention continued pushing for regulation in the industry. In 1948, the International Convention for the Regulation of Whaling came into full force, establishing the International Whaling Commission at its decision-making legislative body, with 14 member states as its founders. The IWC still means, meets annually today, continuing to regulate catch limits, whaling methods, and protected areas on the basis of a three-quarters majority vote. Recognizing more and more threats to whales, the IWC has moved in a broader direction with its conservation agenda, including incidental catches in fishing gear and concerns relating to global warming. 
Today, the IWC has 52 member states that includes whaling countries, ex-whaling countries, and countries that have never whaled that have joined together to conserve the population of whales. This is the type of culture in which the Essex was deeply wounded, and she was your typical whaling vessel. Whaling ships typically were run by smaller crews, the average being six men on smaller ships that harpooned the whale and were towed along by the whale until it grew tired, which is when the ship would kill the whale with a lance and haul it aboard to harvest blubber and oil from it. This was a very dangerous task, and ironically enough, the Essex was known as a very lucky vessel in this endeavor for years. The Essex was a white oak three-mast sailing whaler that was 87 feet long, had a 24-foot beam, and a depth of 12.5 feet, and was allegedly laid down in Amesbury, Massachusetts, though this information is a bit fuzzy. She was launched sometime in 1799 and served as a merchant ship before becoming a whaling vessel based out of Nantucket considered the whaling capital of the United States. On her last voyage, she was manned by 21 men who were primarily white, but did have a small group of free black men, which was uncommon for that time period in the United States. The ship's captain, one of the youngest whaling captains at the time, was a 29-year-old man named Captain George Pollard Jr., and he and his 23-year-old first mate, Owen Chase, had served on the previous journey together. This journey was highly successful and led to both of their promotions, and in August of 1819, they prepared to head out once more. Joining them is the youngest member of the crew, 14-year-old cabin boy Thomas Nickerson. Remember Thomas Nickerson, as his account is a primary source that most historians cite. On August 12, 1819, Essex departed from Nantucket for what was expected to be a two and a half year long voyage to the whaling grounds off of the western coast of South America where the whale population was thriving. On this final voyage, the 21 man crew consisted of seven black men, four island natives, one Englishman, and nine Americans native to Nantucket, including the first mate and captain. Early on in her journey, Essex faced a large sudden squall in the Gulf Stream and was knocked back on her beam ends, nearly sinking the vessel. She lost her top gallant sail, and two of her six whaleboats were destroyed, with a third being damaged. Despite the already foreboding conditions, Captain Pollard decided to push forward with the voyage, lured by the appeal of the lucrative whaling opportunity in South America. In January 1820, after incredibly slow and arduous five-week progress, Essex rounded Cape Horn, or the bottom tip of South America. Because of this disappointing progress and their incident in the Gulf Stream, the crew whispered among themselves about bad omens and if this voyage was doomed from the start. Little did they know just how accurate that assumption would turn out to be. However, their spirits were lifted, if only for a moment, and they saw a possible turnaround on the horizon as Essex began the long spring and summer hunt in the warm waters of the South Pacific Ocean as they traveled north toward the Atacames. When they got to their hunting grounds, the crew was divided into groups of six that all manned the three usable whale boats. Each of the boats was led by the captain or one of the officers, with five other men being elected to go along in each group, and the remaining crew manning the Essex while a whale hunt was in progress. In September of 1820, one of the sailors, a man named Henry Dewitt, deserted at Atakim's. It wasn't uncommon for sailors to ditch whaling vessels, but this was bad news for Captain Pollard and the crew of the Essex. This reduced the crew to just 20 men, and while the three whale boats were out with the six men in each they required, this left only two men to keep the entire vessel. This was not only insufficient, but dangerous. Two men for an entire ship? This ship is doomed! It's definitely not a good sign, Eleanor. The men soon found the area's whale population had already been exploited and they had no luck finding their prey. However, they did stumble upon other fellow whalers who informed them of a large, newly discovered hunting ground that had yet to be depleted of its whales. This area was called the Offshore Ground, located thousands of miles out into the open Pacific Ocean. This distance was far from any known regions to whalers, and the crew had also heard rumblings of cannibals that populated the islands in the area. Before heading to the offshore ground, Essex sailed for current-day Floriana Island in the Galapagos, initially anchoring off the shore of Española Island on October 8, 1820, in order to fix a serious leak that had sprung aboard Essex. 
During the week they anchored, they captured 300 Galapagos giant tortoises to restock their food supplies. Not only were they whaling endangered whales, but they were eating 300 endangered Galapagos giant tortoises too. Yes, truly not sympathetic characters, but the time was much different back then than it is today, with the survivors considering the tortoises a delicacy and highly anticipating the butchering of those poor creatures. In fact, the crew even sailed on to Floriana Island and captured 60 more tortoises for their food stores, letting some of these massive, beautiful animals roam the ship at will. The saddest part of this is that they believed Galapagos giant tortoises could survive for a full year without food or water, though this obviously isn't true and therefore the, deprived the tortoises, slowly starving them to death. Disgusting and irresponsible. While hunting on the island, helmsman Thomas Jeppel decided to set a fire as a prank. Unfortunately, it was the middle of the dry season on the island and it quickly burned out of control. This forced the whalers to run through the flames to get back to the Essex, and as the Essex pulled away the next day, the island was still engulfed in flames. The crew was very upset about the fire and Captain Pollard vowed, through gritted teeth, he would punish whoever set the fire, which was not known to them at the time. After a full day of sailing away, the fire was still visible on the horizon with a thick plume of black smoke creeping toward the sky and out of fear of receiving a whipping Thomas Chapel finally fessed up to the arson. Many years after this, Thomas Nickerson returned to the island to find it still burnt to a crisp, describing that neither trees, shrubbery, nor grass have since appeared. It has even been suggested that the fire contributed to the near extinction of both the Floriana Island tortoise and the Floriana Mockingbird, neither of which inhabit the island in present day. That is so incredibly sad. It is, and all it took was one stupid decision. Speaking of stupid decisions, the Essex finally reached the offshore ground in November of 1820, and the crew still went days and days without seeing a whale. The tensions on board were so thick you could have cut it with a knife, particularly between Captain Pollard and first mate Chase. On November 16th, while the whaling boats were out and about, a whale surfaced directly under first mate Chase's boat, resulting in the boat being dashed literally in pieces. We have finally reached the sinking of Essex and the survival story that ensues. Just a reminder to our listeners, what you are about to hear does include details of a maritime disaster resulting in the sinking of a vessel, cannibalism, emotional and physical distress, whaling, and death that may be disturbing to some audiences. Viewer discretion is advised moving forward in the episode. Thank you, Eleanor. At 8 a.m. on November 20th, 1820, the lookout sighted spouts coming from a pod of sperm whales. The three remaining whaleboats set out to hunt the pod on the leeward or downwind side of Essex. Chase's whaleboat managed to harpoon a whale, but the whale's tail stuck the boat and opened up a seam, forcing the crew to cut the line and retreat to Essex for urgent repairs. Two miles away on the windward or upwind side of Essex, Pollard's whaleboat and the other whaleboat each harpooned a whale and were dragged toward the horizon further from Essex in what whalers cheekily called a Nantucket sleigh ride. First mate Owen Chase was aboard Essex and making repairs to his whaleboat when the crew sighted an abnormally large sperm whale bull acting aggressively. The whale was apparently around 85 feet long, while most sperm whale bulls are around 52 feet long. For a moment, it was motionless at the surface facing the ship before it began to swim toward the vessel, picking up speed by shallow diving. The whale rammed the Essex, rocking the vessel side to side. The whale then dove beneath the Essex, surfacing close to the ship's starboard side. Then, the massive creature lay motionless again with its head next to the bow and its tail at the stern, and the crew at first thought the whale was stunned. Chase prepared to harpoon it from the deck, imagining the payday and the glory he had received from bringing down such a large male, before he realized how close the whale's tail was to the rudder. Chase hesitated. If he attacked the whale and it angered it, it could easily destroy the rudder and set Essex adrift. Before he could finish his thoughts, the whale recovered and swam hundreds of yards forward and turned to face the bow of the ship ominously. In a flash, the sperm whale thrust forward into the water and rammed itself into the bow, crushing it. This sent the vessel reeling backward before the whale tore its head from the splintering wood and swam off, disappearing into the Pacific Ocean. This whale was never sighted again. Meanwhile, 
The Essex was quickly sinking by the bow. Chase and the remaining crew on board were frantic and rigging to the only remaining whaleboat while the steward ran below decks to retrieve Captain Pollard's sea chest and whatever navigational tools he could find as the sailing vessel filled with water rapidly. The official cause of the sperm whale's sudden aggression is not known, although one theory is that the sound of a hammer being used to repair the damaged whale boat on board Essex was similar in frequency to the sound sperm whale bulls use to communicate and echolocate, causing the whale to bump into the ship out of curiosity. It is also unknown how long it took Essex to founder, but considering the damage, it couldn't have taken the vessel long, and she had to have gone down by the bow. Many of the wooden ship's supplies bobbed in the sea, and over the next couple of days, the 20 sailors salvaged what they could from the wreckage. With the captain's sea chest that the steward had managed to recover, they had navigational supplies for Captain Pollard and first mate Chase's boat, with the third boat's only hope of navigation being to stay within sight of the other two boats. Quickly, the officers deduced the nearest islands as the Marquesas, around 1,200 miles to the west of where they were. The men were nervous at as they only had enough fresh water and food to maybe get them to the shore, let alone help them survive on a potentially hostile island. With the rumors of cannibalistic islanders still fresh in their minds, the crew and Chase voted to sail east for South America. Captain Pollard, although he thought this was a horrible idea, as they would have to sail over twice as far as going to Marquias, conceded. They were unable in their small, rinky-dink whaleboats to sail against the trade winds, and would first need to sail 1,000 miles south before they could use the westerlies to turn towards South America, which would still be yet another 3,000 miles to the east. Food and water were immediately rationed, as it was sketchy that they would be able to reach the Marquias, let alone the 4,000-mile journey back towards South America. Most of this food was soaked in seawater, and this only further increased the men's thirst. After two weeks of burning through this contaminated food, the men were rinsing their mouths with seawater and drinking their own urine. Yuck. Yet it isn't foul to think about. Remember the giant tortoises? Several of them were taken aboard the whaleboats to provide food for the crew. Though because of their gargantuan size, they couldn't take them all, and many of these tortoises sadly found themselves at the bottom of the Pacific. The whaleboats were never designed for such large journeys at sea, not to mention that these whaleboats had been repaired crudely multiple times over, and leaks were a constant serious problem. After losing a timber, the crew of one of the boats leaned to one side to raise the other out of the water until another of the boats was able to draw close and nail a piece of wood over the hole. Storms and rough seas constantly battered the whaleboats and their survivors, with men constantly bailing water out of the boats. On December 20th, a month after Essex foundered and within hours of the crew all dying of dehydration, the boat landed on the uninhabited Henderson Island in the British territory of the Pitcairn Islands. 120 miles to the southwest, they could have received help on Pitcairn Island itself as the descendants of the survivors of HMS Bounty still lived there, but were unaware of the crew of the Essex. The crew falsely believed they had landed on Ducie Island, similar coral atoll 220 miles to the east. On the small atoll of Henderson Island, the crew of the Essex found a small freshwater spring and they gorged themselves on this water along with crabs, eggs, peppergrass, and endemic birds. After just a week of being stranded there, they had almost completely exhausted Henderson Island's food sources. On December 26, 1820, the men concluded that they would starve and could no longer stay. As most of the crew prepared the whale boats to leave, stocking it with crab and fresh water, three men who were not natives of Nantucket, chose to stay behind. These three men were William Wright, Seth Weeks, and Thomas Chapel, the helmsmen who lit Floriana Island ablaze. It was reported later that these three men were rescued a year after the sinking of the Essex by a ship called Surrey, and they were taken back to Port Jackson, Australia. The remaining 17 crew in the whale boats resumed a seaward journey on December 27, 1820 in the direction they thought Easter Island was. Within three days, they had run out of the crabs and birds they'd brought from Henderson Island, only having a small ration of bread left from the Essex. On January 4, 1821, they suspected they'd traveled too far south to reach Easter Island and instead decided to go for Masatiera Island, which was 1,808 miles to the east of them and 419 miles west off the coast of South America. Soon, the men began to die. 
Just a warning to our listeners, what we're about to discuss includes details of death and cannibalism. Listener discretion is advised. The first of the men to die was second mate Matthew Joy, whose health had been poor before the Essex foundered and only worsened after. Joy asked Captain Pollard if he could rest on Pollard's boat until his death, and on January 10th, he did die. The following day, first mates Chase Whaleboat became separated from the other two during a squall. Our primary source, Thomas Nickerson, was on this boat. Richard Peterson, the oldest of the crew, lost the will to live after being stranded at sea for so long and passed away on January 18th. As with second mate Joy, he was sewn into his clothes and buried at sea, which was the custom at the time. On February 8th, another member, Isaac Cole, passed away only he was not interned at sea. With food running out, the survivors discussed and decided to keep his body, eating his liver and kidneys, but they struggled with the chewy muscular tissue of their cohort. This was the first act of cannibalism among the Essex crew. On the third boat run by crew member Obed Hendricks, the food supplies ran completely out by January 14th and Captain Pollard generously offered to share his whaleboat's rations with the struggling crew members. All of them ran out of food seven days later on January 21st, with crew member Lawson Thomas dying on January 20th, and the crew deciding to keep his body as food rations. Crew member Charles Shorter died on January 23rd, Isaiah Shepard on January 27th, and Samuel Reed on January 28th, all of the bodies presumably being kept as rations. Later on January 28th, Hendricks and Pollard were separated, with Hendricks's boat never being seen again. A whale boat was later found washed up on Ducey Island with three skeletons inside, but it was never confirmed as the three missing men from Hendrix's boat. By February 1st on Pollard's boat, the food supply once again ran out, and the survivor's situation became more than dire. The men basically did a straw poll to figure out who would be sacrificed in order to feed the rest of the crew, and Captain Pollard's 18-year-old cousin, whom he'd sworn to protect, drew the short straw. The young man, Owen Coffin, shook his head when Pollard offered to take his place, allegedly saying, No, I like my lot as well as any other. Damn, those are some dark words from the young man knowing he was going to be eaten by his cousin and comrades. Yes, it's very dark and disturbing stuff. Straws were then again pulled to see who would be Coffin's executioner, and fellow crew member Charles Ramsdell, who happened to be Owen Coffin's friend, drew this short straw. He shot Coffin with Ramsdell, Pollard, and... Barzillai, Barzillai Ray consuming the body. On February 11th, Ray also died and was consumed by the remaining two. Pollard and Ramsdell survived by gnawing on coffins and Ray's skeletal remains. Meanwhile, on Chase's boat by February 15th, the three survivors once again ran out of food. Three days later, on February 18th, 89 days after the founding of Essex, the British vessel Indian spotted and rescued Chase, Lawrence, and Nickerson. A few days later, the empty whale boat that was being towed behind the Indian was destroyed in a storm. Pollard's boat was rescued on February 23rd by the Nantucket whale ship Dauphin, with only Pollard and Ramsdell left alive, disassociative after their traumatic time at sea. After a lot of ship shuffling in South America, long story short, the eight survivors ended up back in Nantucket after having eaten seven fellow crew. All eight survivors returned to whaling within months of their return to Nantucket, with novelist Herman Melville later speculating everyone would have survived had they gone toward Tahiti like Captain Pollard had originally suggested. He later went on to write the novel Moby Dick that was heavily inspired by the sinking of the Essex. The wreckage of the Essex has yet to be found, but her approximate location is roughly 1,000 miles away from the Marquesas Islands. Thank you for tuning in to Shipwreck Sunday. If you like this episode and are listening on YouTube, please give us a like, leave us a comment, and subscribe to our channel. If you like this episode and are listening on Spotify, Samsung Podcasts, Amazon Music, or another podcast service, please subscribe for more content and leave us a five-star review as it does help us reach more listeners like you. Tune in next Sunday for the story of SS Pacific, a sidewheel steamer that disappeared with all hands on deck in 1856 and whose fate is still unknown to this day. Don't forget to check out our sister podcast, Slasher Saturday. Have a great week, and we will see you next time.